So, Martin, welcome to the Suspicious Transaction Report. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about the Russian central bank assets, uh, a topic that seems to have got policymakers and, and, and bankers tied up in knots. Just go back to the beginning, can you, and set, set the scene. Why are we talking about CBR assets? Well, let's just start by talking about central banks for 10 seconds. Uh, central banks are the banks of governments. Uh, they hold assets in foreign currency in order to manage foreign exchange transactions, uh, smooth foreign trade. All central banks in the world do this. Uh, so they will have, you know, traditionally they used to have gold, now they have securities issued by other governments, and that includes the Russian Central Bank. Um, and so the Russian Central Bank uh, had, it reported before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, that it had, you know, $300, 350000000000 billion worth of assets in the Western countries, in the US, especially in the Eurozone, but in the UK. Um, and um, what happened about a week into the full-scale war was that these Western countries did something that has almost never been done before. And they said, well, you know, we're going to block access to this. 300, 350 billion, you don't get to manage it anymore. You don't get to withdraw it. You don't get to exchange it. You don't get to do anything about it. They in the jargon, they immobilized it. But they basically told Russia, you can't touch it. Uh, and since then, the question has been, should we do something more? Should we not just stop access to this, but actually seize it, confiscate it, and give it to Ukraine to help it rebuild its country? So just an important couple of uh, definitional points, if you like. We talk about immobilized, not frozen. So I'd like to kind of understand why that is. And secondly, maybe just a word on what do we mean when we talk about securities and so on? Because it's an yeah. important consideration as to actually what these assets are. I think that's uh, really important. Let, let's start with the second one. Um, securities are, are bonds, promises to pay that are issued by governments. Uh, so we're talking about government bonds. So again, this is something all governments do. They go out to the markets. They say, well, we have a deficit. The year we need to raise you know, 10 billion pounds, 20 billion dollars, huge sums. And these are basically, in the old days, they would be phys physical paper saying, you know, the government of uh, Her Majesty's government or the US government promises to pay full faith of credit this much to the bearer of this bond. Today, this is all electronic. But they're still essentially uh, promises to pay by governments, and they're considered the safest thing that there is. Um, so the reason why central banks have ended up holding these things is on the other side, if you have some extra money you need to set aside for a rainy day to manage flows later on, the safest you can do about it is to buy US government bonds or put them on deposit with another central bank. So this is just how the international financial system works. Central banks hold each other's government's um, promises to pay or they put money on deposit with one another. It's basically a sort of web of mutual commitments. Um, you talked about the difference between freezing and immobilizing. People sometimes just say that these assets are frozen, and in colloquial language, it means the same thing. Um, technically, it's not quite the same thing, and it's basically because frozen is what we've done with private assets, so Russian oligarchs, for example, friends of Putin. Um, and in that case, it's a particular type of legal mechanism under a particular kind of law. In the case of the Central Bank of Russia, we haven't frozen these assets under that kind of law. So the Central Bank of Russia is not on a list of sanctioned entities. What the Western governments have done instead is simply to make it illegal for anyone in their jurisdictions to help the Central Bank of Russia do anything with this. So one way it was explained to me once uh, was that uh, you can... Uh, you can make something untouchable or just make it uh, illegal to touch it. So, you know, it's a bit of a distinction without a difference, but for legal matters, uh, there is a technical difference there. And, and back to the point about securities, and well, I think we'll come on to this, but but this this government-to-government -government IOU is, is quite an important concept because there might actually be a solution that we can explore uh, if we understand what that actually means. Now, you've referred to a, a few numbers. You've referred to how the Central Bank of Russia uh, reported what assets it had. About a year ago, you were sort of saying that you were puzzled that uh, European governments and, and governments of um, Ukraine's allies weren't able to sort of figure out what assets they held. Why didn't we know more precisely? So many numbers have been flying around. Yeah. You know, when I was, when I was starting to try to understand this debate about whether to confiscate and transfer the money to Ukraine in, in 2022, I kind of took it for granted. I just made the assumption that somebody sits on a master list of what all the holdings of the Russian Central Bank uh, are. 
Uh, and okay, they haven't published it, but maybe they should. But anyway, when I started to ask people, it turned out there wasn't such a master list. So the various governments may have had pieces of information, but there wasn't a single comprehensive view of what it was. And the fact that the number around 300 billion was used quite a lot also in the Western discussion, that money, that number came from Russian public reporting, from the Russian Central Bank itself. Now, we should say that the Russian Central Bank was recognized and respected as a very professional institution in the central banking community, in the financial world, before uh, Putin's full-scale invasion. So there's little reason to doubt that the numbers it used to put out were probably correct. You can never be totally certain. Uh, but the point is that that was everything, that was, that was the only thing anyone had to go on. Now, over time, Western governments uh, have started to collect this information and to share it all privately. They've been very coy about publishing any of this. But it seems like, uh, it seems to me that by now they have a pretty good picture of where it is. And when they have made quite spotty announcements, um, it does seem to add up to pretty much the same picture as what you would have thought from the Russian data to begin with. And any reason why this these numbers seem to be secret in some way and, and governments aren't willing? Because there's, there's a real array of responses. Some governments have been quite open about the assets that they've identified. Others are stumm. That, that's right. Some, most have not said anything. Uh, a few have come out with not very formal announcements in, you know, ministers have given press interviews. So famously and importantly, the Belgian prime minister has told the press that Euroclear, a, a sort of a storage warehouse for securities that's based in Belgium, holds something like 190 billion euros worth of the Russian central bank's uh, assets. Um, and a couple of other ministers have come out with announcements like that. But there's been very little in the way of formal accounting. You know, here is how much it is, in what form, and so on. Um, Euroclear itself has published some numbers. And you can kind of triangulate between these to, to get a rough picture of, uh, as I said, the Russian numbers seem pretty, uh, pretty reasonable. I don't know why they've been so coy about this. Um, I can think of two reasons. Neither is a very good reason. Uh, one is that making it very clear how much money was where would increase the political pressure to move towards confiscation. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is that there's a, there's sort of a, a culture of secrecy in central banking traditionally. There's a bit of a, a kind of fellowship of central bankers. They're all in a bit of a, they do a bit of a mysterious job. They all understand each other and nobody else understands them. And I think traditionally, it just hasn't been the case that one steps on anyone else's toes. And I think discretion is probably how one would think of it, is a strong tradition. So it, it would take something big uh, to break with that. Of course, something big has happened, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But still, we're still struggling. And it took some political push to even share all these numbers between governments behind closed doors. So another, another definitional point, uh, briefly, you mentioned Euroclear. And in reporting, it looks like Belgium is holding mm. all the Russian yeah. central bank assets. Yes. Unpack that for us, because that's not strictly speaking correct. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not strictly speaking correct. It, it, it's quite misleading. Uh, so we said earlier on that, that the typical central bank reserve, money you keep safe for when you need it, traditionally gold, now mostly, although Russia still holds quite a lot of gold, but now mostly securities from other governments, sort of safe paper or deposits with other central banks. But let's think about these securities. So, so that's a, a commitment in electronic form from the US government or, or the French government or the German government or the British government to, to pay a certain amount. Um, in practice, the way this is managed, you don't have a direct relationship between the investor, in this case, the Russian central bank, or, or could be anybody else that's invested in these securities and the issuer itself. So you don't have a direct line between somebody who's put some money in gilts, for example, in the UK, and the government. Uh, this is all you know, put into a sort of warehouse, an institution that specializes in managing these claims when there are payments to be made, when a bond matures and becomes, turns into cash, the loan is paid back, if you like, or if there's interest to be paid over time, uh, 
it's the institution in the middle that just deals with this and you hold a securities account with them a bit like like it was a bank. So Euroclear is one of the biggest institutions of that kind in the world. Um, these are called uh, centralized securities depositories, CSDs. And they do a sort of management job. Uh, I think warehousing is a good way to think about it. Custodians, you can you can call them. But that means the Russian Central Bank has a legal relationship with a private institution in Belgium, but it's a relationship to manage legal claims on governments in other countries, and it, it's basically the big G7 governments. So that's where the confusion arises. Yeah, yeah, it's not that uh, not, not not the Belgium itself as a country holds all these assets. So look, let's dive into to the details and the, the complexities. Um, I want to go back to the Swedish presidency of the EU, which was during the first half of 2023. And at the time, the Swedish uh, prime minister said about the central bank assets, I quote, in principle, it is clear cut. Russia must pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. At the same time, this poses difficult questions. This must be done in accordance with EU and international law. And there is currently no direct model for this. So unpack that on the one hand, simple, but very yeah. complex statement. I mean, I think he, he chose his words quite wisely. There's no model for this. You know, this hasn't something like this hasn't been done before. You know, smaller versions, but not quite similar enough. Um, so we're in uncharted territory, both politically and, and to some extent legally. Now, I think the easiest way to understand this is that from the, the leading political level, prime ministers and leaders, there's, there's been a sense that politically it'd be good if we could just force Russia to, to pay for its damage. And uh, we should note that the United Nations General Assembly voted almost unanimously for a resolution in 2022 that included uh, a, a declaration that Russia has to pay compensation for the damage it's wrought in Ukraine. And, and nobody's disputed that that is an international law obligation. Uh, but how do you, does that mean you can simply take the assets of a country that you think has this obligation? What is the legal process to do that? I mean, certainly when we deal with private individuals and, and, and private entities and their property, all kinds of constraints are put in place, due process, human rights, rights to property, and so on. You have to really document and, and go through some sort of process before you can seize somebody's property. Now, we don't really have a model for this uh, in the case of sovereigns outside of outright war, where people have just taken the, the, the enemy's assets. That has not been a problem. But of course, the West is not at war with Russia and has gone out of its way to say it's not. In Ukraine, the Ukrainian state has seized, confiscated Russian state property. That's that's easy legally. Uh, it's turned out to be a huge headache for Western countries, um, partly because especially the EU is a stickler for rules. I mean, the whole block is really set up on a legal framework where you have to identify the legal basis for doing something, partly because the individual countries that could in principle move in this direction, and, and some have, Canada, for example, uh, and we can, we can talk about that, has made some steps towards making this possible, but nobody wants to do it on their own because then, then you're exposed, then if, if you treat central bank assets in a way that nobody else does, then you're quite likely to see other countries start to pull their assets out. So this has been the financial economic worry here, which, which we'll also, I'm sure, talk a bit more about. Um, but the whole, the dilemma the whole time has been, okay, politically there's some pressure to do this. Uh, legally, procedurally, policy-wise, you know, how do we do this in a way that doesn't seem to violate our own laws, won't be contested, God forbid, won't be tested in court and we lose and Russia wins. Uh, so this, this was all reasonable worries at the start. I have a feeling that it's been allowed to drag out for quite a long time and that the legal arguments are, are becoming somewhat uh, vicarious. But just to finish by where you started on the Swedish presidency, my understanding was that from the top political level, there was quite a strong desire for from Sweden and others to, to make this, you know, find a way to make this happen. And then a lot of obstacles being thrown in the way of the process along the way, and you didn't really get anywhere. Yeah, we had the opportunity on a visit to Stockholm to to meet with the people who were 
recovering from having held the presidency. This was a meeting back in uh, September. And yes, you kind of really got the sense that there was some frustration there. And certain people, and we'll come on to Christine Lagarde and others, had sort of thrown a monkey wrench into the machinery at a, a critical moment. Now, one phrase you didn't use there, we've talked a lot about law, but one phrase you didn't use there, but again, one hears quite often, is the question of sovereign immunity, which again seems to come up as a sticking point for yeah. some people. What, what, what do we mean by that? Well, let me start by saying I'm not a lawyer, so I'll just share my, my layman's understanding of, of talking to a lot of lawyers. Um, and it turns out that depending on which lawyer you talk to, you may get slightly different answers. Um, but sovereign immunity was a phrase that I first encountered when I started asking, well, why are we not just moving ahead to, you know, first, why is it immobilized rather than frozen? The answer was sovereign immunity. Why can't we just confiscate sovereign immunity? Um, the idea here is that as it's part of international law, but largely customary international law, i.e. how states by convention treat one another, um, is that above all, a state can't be tried in another state's courts. That's a very basic principle. Uh, and some lawyers have understood this to include that another state's assets can't be seized uh, through any judicial process, maybe not at all. Um, most of this hasn't been codified, uh, or not. there's not a treaty that everyone signed up to that says that this is so. Uh, there are a lot of national laws that encode this principle. There are draft articles that, that encode it. But there's some dispute even about what, what those mean. But I think we have to come back to the idea of customary international law. You know, basically, states have never done this towards each other before unless they were at war pretty much never done this uh, against each other. So um, some lawyers will say, look, sovereign immunity basically means you can't touch this money. And that has led to a bit of a, a, bit of a wild goose chase towards alternatives. Then there are other lawyers who say, well, actually, that's a misunderstanding. First of all, sovereign immunity only applies to court judgments. It's about not being exposed to court judgments. It doesn't stop simple legislative or executive action to just seize this money. Um, that's been one answer. Another answer is that even if there is such a prohibition, well, international law also includes uh, provisions to deal with other people's breaches of international law, which undoubtedly Russia's invasion is. So there's something called countermeasures. So one doctrine, perhaps the most influential one, is that because of what Russia has done, it's legitimate for the West to say we will seize and transfer this money in response to their violation. That's where the legal debate is now. Uh, but as I said, that's basically where the legal debate was six months, 12 months ago. So I have a feeling that we're now getting into kind of political stasis rather than unresolved. You know, we know what the different legal arguments are. It's decision time and decisions don't seem to be taken yet. So there are there are lots of proposals out there uh, trying to shape shift around the, the kind of the international law question, sovereign immunity, and, and everything else, uh, and they seem to fall into sort of two halves. You've got sort of market based solutions that some people uh, have proposed that I personally find quite attractive, and then you've got more sort of uh, I don't know complex solutions like taking the profits or applying a tax, everything short of actually confiscating the assets. So maybe you could take us through some of those um, examples and how they have uh, dealt with reality when confronted with reality. Yeah. Um, you know, let, let, me, let me pause the market engineering, financial engineering ones for a second, and, and you may want to share some of the ones you've seen. Um, and I'll just talk about the ones that, uh, that have tried to not deal with financial engineering, but simply avoid coming up against this sovereign immunity objection. Uh, so th there have been various variants of the idea that instead of taking the assets, you can maybe access the profits on the assets because these assets are sitting there. Russia cannot gain any profit from it because that's part of the immobilization. So, you know, maybe the profits, maybe... You know, the different versions of it. At one point, there was a, the idea that you could kind of take temporary control of the assets, invest them, and you use the return, and then you put the assets back. Uh, that didn't go anywhere because it's equally legally problematic. The one that has legs now and it is, in fact, making some progress uh, in EU legislation uh, is to look at these 
central securities depositories we talked about, especially Euroclear. So what's happening there is that a lot of these securities that Russia owns are maturing. They are coming to the end of the, the lifetime and turn into cash. They're basically paid back by the governments in question. But that cash can't be given to Russia, so it sort of accumulates at Euroclear. Euroclear doesn't have to pay any interest to Russia. This is like if you, if a listener has an investment account, they will know that the cash in that pays usually zero. But Euroclear itself has to put this money somewhere while it's waiting. And the safest place you can put them is into our central banks, where interest rates have gone from zero to about 4%, 4 or 5%, depending on the central bank, uh, in just a year or two. So there's a spread there. You know, you, you pay zero, you gain 4 or 5%. Um, and so this is why just last year, Euroclear has just issued uh, 2023 results. They made about $4 billion in net profits just on this segregated uh, cash. So uh, in the EU now, there has been uh, a move towards saying, well, that money has to be, first of all, kind of kept separate, those profits. Uh, and in time, we may get to a point where we legislate to do a windfall tax and tax away 100% of that, and that money could go to Ukraine. I think that is probably going to happen. Um, the issue with it is that it's obviously much less than the assets themselves, which are in the hundreds of billions. Here we'll be talking about single-digit billion. I mean, that's, it's not nothing, um, but it's, it's a different order of magnitude. Uh, the political issue that worries me is that we're going to, if we go to all this effort to avoid touching the principle itself, the assets themselves, we are almost unwittingly strengthening the premise of the view that we can't touch. It's legally impossible to touch the assets. That's, that's the question that has to be decided, uh, and we shouldn't be prejudicing that question, and I, and I fear we are. And then on the sort of the market-based uh, solutions, I mean, some of the things that, that say interest me is you have a stack of immobilized uh, assets. They're not going anywhere. Whether they go anywhere is controlled by the UK, the US, the EU, and so on. So to my mind, they sit there as a kind of pool of collateral that one could borrow against. Or So I don't know, what sort of conversations have you heard about yeah, market-based solutions? Yeah, I, I heard quite a lot of this in... Uh, 2022, a bit, a bit in 2023, and they all have something in common, which is, as you say, you know, let's let's raise money on the markets for Ukraine, and they will get a good rate. They'll get good terms because we link them to, we use this frozen, immobilized money as collateral. Um, now, I've always been skeptical of those solutions because collateral is there to be taken in case the borrower doesn't pay back. So the idea is. If you're going to lend money to the Ukrainian state now, you'll demand a pretty high interest rates because this is a country under attack. It has huge debt. You know, who knows if it survives? You will not. You know, you'll want a very high rate, a prohibitive rate, maybe. Um, but if you knew that if they can't pay back, then you can seize these uh, frozen or immobilized assets that Russia owns. Then, of course, then it's safe. Then it's fine. So you don't have to demand a very high rate. But that just takes us back to the original problem. If you can't, if Western governments can't legally confiscate these assets, then how could you make good on the collateral? How could you seize the collateral? I haven't seen a good way around that, uh, that obstacle that wouldn't also at the same time solve the original problem of why you can't just confiscate um, to begin with. So, so it seems to me that it's a solution the market engineering, the financial engineering options are really only solutions that would work in a world where you wouldn't have the problem in the first place. Or perhaps a kind of a timing uh, solution, because one thought is, well, states like the UK and the US and the EU are you know, paying vast amounts of money to support Ukraine. So if you were to sell those bonds, raise the money in the market today, backed by guarantees from places like the EU, the EU might well have to pay 50 billion euros at some point in the future, but it doesn't have to pay it today because the money comes from the from the market. And I think there's a question in my mind, you know, we've got elections in the US and in other places, and sadly, support for funding Ukraine is waning. And so we kind of, I think, owe it to the people of Ukraine and to the taxpayers of the countries that have been supporting Ukraine to sort of try and identify ways in which we can lessen the burden on the coffers of, 
the United States or wherever. No, I, I think you're pointing out something very important and that, that we haven't touched on yet, but the politics around this is that it's become very difficult to raise money directly from taxpayers for Ukraine. And I think that has that has concentrated minds in Washington and in Brussels and, and elsewhere. Um, if we can't raise this money, if we can't get a support package for Ukraine through the US Congress, and there's all this Russian money sitting there, why are we not moving to, to take that? Now, uh, you know, there's some good news. You know, we're recording this on the day when the European Council did in the end agree, even with Hungary, to, uh, to, to find 50 billion for, for Ukraine. Um, but, the, but the point remains. Now, I think you're right. Uh, if you have Western governments guaranteeing for the money uh, that Ukraine would get, then you could raise it in the markets. Um, my issue is that you can't directly legally link that with the Russian foreign reserves, the Russian central bank reserves, unless you make the decision that legally we can actually take title to this in some circumstances. Uh, what you could do, uh, as I proposed this a, a while back, is you could say, well, you know, we will guarantee bonds issued by Ukraine against a treaty commitment by Ukraine that when it does get compensation, war reparations from Russia, that will first go to uh, reimburse these bonds. Now, that wouldn't create any legal claim on the Russian reserves, but it would rather strengthen the West incentives to enforce Russia's uh, reparations obligations sometime in the future. So that would be a way of, of changing uh, changing expectations, maybe it would maybe make markets think, yeah, I mean, the Western countries they will really make Russia do this eventually because otherwise they're on the line, so it's safe. So you could, but but I think of that as kind of uh, economic engineering rather than financial engineering around the idea of legal collateral. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge, as you say, political, economic, financial uh, mashup. I did just before we turn a bit to politics, I did want to just dwell briefly on Canada, because Canada has been on the whole topic, actually, of kind of asset confiscation, a bit of an outlier in what it's been proposing. So maybe you could explain a bit about you know, the Canada approach to all of this. Yes. And the context here is, of course, that Canada is uh, is very committed to Ukraine, you know, Ukraine's closest friends, maybe. Um, they have... Uh, they have tried to, they have actually changed their legislation. So in 2022, summer of 2022, they, they put in place uh, a provision in their own legislation that said in the case of a grave breach of uh, international law or, or humanitarian law, uh, the government, with the approval of a judge, can seize, confiscate assets belonging to a transgressing state for the purposes of transferring them to the victim of, of those violations. Um, so legally, that was put in place. I think the idea was partly to set an example to other countries. That this is how we can do it, legally speaking. Uh, there are two issues here. One is that uh, the fact that they included a court process in this legislation means that there's a risk that this sovereign immunity problem mm -hmm. appears again. Because as we said earlier, sovereign immunity seems most clearly present in the case of actual court proceedings, judicial proceedings. So I think it's been recognized that maybe it wasn't very well drafted. And there is work happening in Canada to, to amend the law so that that is taken out. Uh, but the other issue is political. So they put in place the legal tools under domestic law, at least, to do this. They so far haven't tried to actually employ that legal mechanism. Uh, not for sovereign assets. They may have done it for some private oligarch assets. Um, so even Canada seems very cautious on this, doesn't want to go it alone. They have, I think you're right to say that they have been in the forefront on this, but it seems like they haven't felt confident or safe enough to, to go ahead uh, and do it on its own. And you know, they too come up with these, what I think are really excuses, saying that most of the Canadian money is in any case in Belgium, because it's uh, is at Euroclear, and you can see this, there are Canadian dollar-denominated amounts in what the Euroclear accounts show up. So, so they have they have gone the furthest, but they haven't been willing to go that far ahead of the pack yet. So I think in the end, uh, what all of this is going to hinge on is whether you get a G7 agreement. Uh, 
uh, on doing this. And they have to basically decide we're all going to jump together. Well, that's a great segue because I was about to, I was about to ask about the, the G7 because G7 leaders have committed, and again, I quote, consistent with our respective legal systems, Russia's sovereign assets in our jurisdictions will remain immobilized until Russia pays for the damage it has caused to Ukraine. So, the, so how should we read that commitment? Is the G7 signaling that it will eventually get to the point where um, the, the central bank assets are confiscated in some shape or form, or are they just kicking the can down the road to say, we'll deal with it in some date in the future? Yeah, I think it's hard to answer. It seems to me it's probably a bit of both, because on the one hand, it's clearly a political signal that we want Russia to pay to compensate for its damage. Uh, and we will hold Russia to that, and uh, we will hold on to this money. And it's, this, this has been said at G7 leaders' level several times. That's you know politically very important. It's been said by individual leaders and governments uh, separately on, on more occasions. So this is the policy of the West, to say you don't get this money back until you've paid compensation, which, economically speaking, is kind of the same as saying that money will eventually go straight to Ukraine. That's kind of the same as saying Russia gets it back in the moment it pays Ukraine. Mm. Now, I think it's also, as I said, kicking kicking the can down the road, um, or, or as you said, because if that's what your policy is, why not go straight ahead then and simply transfer, enforce this obligation to pay compensation by simp simply make the compensation be paid out of Russian funds. You, you could do that if, if that is what your policy is. So I think there's a bit of can kicking, which is basically, well, let's, let's postpone the, the kind of biggest decision, the jump itself. There's a bit of that. I worry that there's also a bit of hedging going on. So you can imagine that in a situation after some sort of ceasefire, maybe some domestic political change in, in Russia, whatever it would take to stop the fighting. Uh, voices that are currently repressed, self-repressed in the West, uh, will come to the surface saying that this is not a moment to destabilize Russia, this is a point where we have to encourage better behavior and so on to build bridges again. I mean, I've heard people say this privately, nobody wants to say it publicly, but that is an opinion in the West. Uh, which means that there's there's what economists, economics nerds like me will call time inconsistency. Mm. Uh, this is a policy that is now stated, but it's not clear how believable it is at the point in time in the future where it would have to be carried out. So so that's why I, um, I think it's hard to know exactly how to read it. And it may well be that the leaders themselves haven't thought all the way through this. And, and it's a bit of a placeholder saying the right things now. But, you know, given that that's what the policy is now, it's why people like, like me try to say, well, look, if that's what you believe, you should go further today. Yes. And as a, an ex-investment banker, I would say, well, let's monetize that promise today. Yes, uh, exactly. And, and not yeah. kick the can down the road. And actually, my fear is that there will be another reason will be found to dither and delay, as you say, when that, that moment comes. Now, Russia is obviously still earning foreign currency. Yeah. It's still trading with many parts of of the world. And you've written quite a bit about what I think you refer to as shadow reserves. So can we just dwell on that briefly? Because that's also an important, I think, yeah. consideration in all of this. I mean, let's let's think about how Russia or the Russian Central Bank came to have hundreds of billions in uh, on deposit or in securities in other central banks to begin with. And it's because they're a big uh, export surplus nation. They export a lot of oil and gas, uranium, other commodities, uh, much more than they import. So they've in general, are uh, they earn a large export surplus. So that that's money above and beyond what they have to spend on imports. So that's savings, right? It's it's as if you don't consume everything you earn every month as an individual. So you, you put it somewhere. Uh, it's those savings. Now, some of that was immobilized, the accumulated savings, but they've gone on to make surpluses for two years. It's almost vanished now because there have been various uh, policies, sanctions policies to, to prevent their them from making too much money on their oil sales. Of course, they pretty much stopped selling gas to Europe, not quite, but largely. Uh, so we are now getting to the point where they don't have that much of a surplus. But over two years, they they probably made, you know, could be $200 billion, you know, a comparable amount to the amount that was immobilized. That money must have been saved up somewhere. That's kind of arithmetic. It's just how it works. 
we know extremely little about where that is. We we know that it will have been paid by the customers of these of this energy. Some of that will have been been Europe or other Western nations companies. So at some point at the start, it will have been in these jurisdictions. Um, you know, probably quite a lot of money paid into Gazprom's bank in Luxembourg, Gazprom Bank. Where it's gone after that, from public sources, we have very little clue. Um, it's not that easy to move that much money. I'm sure they've tried to spirit some of it away to to countries that are close to the Western financial system but not part of the sanctioning coalition, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, places like that. Uh, but it's very hard, impossible to trace really from public sources. And if governments are trying to trace this, they are not telling us. And uh, I worry that they may not be doing enough to trace it at all. Mm. Mm. Yes, it's a... a, a the central banking world is is quite a conundrum now. So I wanted to try and bring things to a to a close and focus on again back on sort of the market side a bit because uh, in Davos recently, uh, back in January, the Standard Chartered CEO uh, Bill Winters, who I know from my own experience, I used to work with him, he knows a thing or two about financial markets. He told the BBC that seizing the central bank assets may be the right thing to do, but he endorsed concerns about the weaponization of central banks and currencies. And Christine Lagarde, who we mentioned earlier on, the uh, president of the European Central Bank, has also expressed some pretty influential concern that a move by Brussels to take money would be uh, problematic and tarnish the euro and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, what, what's your perspective on that? Is that really the case? I mean, we've had two years of intervention against the Russian central bank, and I don't see the markets being particularly unhappy. So is that a genuine concern? I don't think so. I'm I'm with you on this. But let me first say that I find it uh, quite frustrating and, and frankly irresponsible that there's a lot of very vague scaremongering here. It's very hard to pin people, you know, I've spoken to people from the European Central Bank and elsewhere trying to say, what, what is it exactly that you're worried about? So it could theoretically be two things. So one is market turmoil, that markets freak out and you get some sort of financial instability event. Well, um, as, as many of us, uh, I'm sure you have too, have pointed out, there have been times in this process where they should have freaked out already. One was when the assets were immobilized in the first place. Uh, the second was when the G7 leaders committed to what you read out earlier, to say, well, you won't get this money back until you do what we say. I mean, that too is unprecedented and an interference with how this the central bank reserves are supposed to work. So already we've breached some principles. Nobody's freaked out. Uh, so I don't think that seizing would, would lead to some sort of market instability. I mean, the other worry is slightly more plausible. Uh, and it's not about markets, it's about central banks. So Russia, the central bank of Russia is not the only central bank that holds reserves in, in Western countries. Uh, China, People's Bank of China and, and its various funds is the biggest one. And there are many emerging countries, emerging economies that do the same. Ever since the Asian financial crisis 25 years ago and also the global financial crisis, a lot of emerging economies decided to build up these big war chests in case of a financial crisis or capital flight. So, so there's a lot of money there. And um, as I said, the more plausible worry that Western countries might have is that those countries will no longer trust the European Central Bank or the Eurozone, the US, and so on. They'll start pull their reserves back. Well, my response to that is, again, uh, you didn't see any of that in the earlier events with the actual immobilization decision uh, or these political statements. Uh, so, so far, there's no sign of that nervousness. But, you know, of, of course, they're looking at it and they're asking, could this happen to us? What if China decides to invade Taiwan, right? Um, but what if they did? Well, China, where would they put the money instead? So the, the most obvious candidate is China. That's where Russia has put some of the reserves it started to take out before the full-scale war. China can't put its own reserves in China. China doesn't really have anywhere else to go. It's not going to start putting reserves in where, India or Brazil or something. Other emerging economies, they presumably could shift towards China. Uh, but if what you're worried about is the risk that uh, politics will dominate how safe your assets are, nobody's going to think that China is not a political risky, politically risky place to store your money either. I mean, that's as politicized, a more politicized economy than Western economies are. Um, the rule of law 
is much stronger in Western countries. And depending a bit on how it's done, you know, this sort of decision of seizing the Russian central bank reserves would have to be very well delineated through a clear process where it's very clear what it took to to cross this line. Um, but even then, so suppose there is a reallocation of reserves. How damaging is that to the West? Maybe not all that damaging. Does it mean you get a little bit less cheap financing from developing countries? Probably, but... You know, economists for 25 years have warned that actually large foreign exchange reserves and the surpluses required to build them up, that's financially destabilizing. So, you know, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing if countries accumulated a bit less. In any case, you know, let's just step back and look at the big picture here. So you, you quoted Bill Winchester talking about the weaponization of foreign uh, central bank reserves. I find the, the word choice quite telling. You know, let's forget that real weapons are being used here, right? We, there is a war. People are being killed and uh, tortured and raped in Ukraine. Uh, there's terrible destruction happening. That's weaponization. So I think that's the context in which we have to, to talk about this. How big a, you know, how dramatic a breach would this be in the context of what is going on? That's a really great place to end. Martin, thank you very much indeed. I encourage listeners to follow your writing in the FT on this topic. I fear you'll be writing about this for quite some time to come. But thank you again very much for joining us. Thank you.